everyone. Good morning. I'm Richard Herskowitz, the program director at the Ashland Independent Film Festival. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming out this morning for the first of the talkbacks. And you know, the talkbacks uh, this year are structured so that this session today, uh, we're going to learn about the history of um, uh, independent documentary from two key figures in the history over the past 50 years. Uh, is going to be complemented on Sunday by a session we're doing here on the future of independent documentary, some of the new directions, a uh, session on transmedia and virtual reality documentary. Helen Michelle, who's here, is a transmedia documentarian, and she is going to uh, be on stage here with Brad Lichtenstein, who is also somebody very involved with Cartemquin Films, has worked for them, with, with them for many years, and he is going to bring demos with him. You're going to be able to, to demonstrate, you're, you're going to be able to try out um, the virtual reality gear that filmmakers are beginning to use right now to make films. So anyway, and in between the talk back on tomorrow at 10 a.m. is uh, Women Make Indie Movies. So uh, another thing about, to give context before I turn things over to the moderator, uh, this is part, this particular talk back is part of the tribute we're doing to Cartemquin Films on their 50th anniversary. And there's several screenings. Some of you, were you at the secret screening last night? Um, we, we, we premiered, it's going to be repeated, but it's a film that we're showing here in advance of its world premiere from Cartemquin. And, um, also, there is a program, if you're interested in the history, of two classic Cartemquin films from the 70s, Chicago Maternity Center Story and Women Voice, Women's Voices, the Gender Gap movie, with a very recent film from Cartemquin, um, also one of the important feminist films from Cartemquin, a knockout picture called On Beauty, and the filmmaker Joanna Rudnick will be here for that. So, and then a third Cartemquin film, In the Game, and the filmmaker uh, Maria Finizzo will be here to compliment that. Anyway, that's a, a section within this festival. So now I just want to tell you about our mo moderator before I turn things over to him to introduce uh, the guests. Um, Stephen uh, Bognar actually uh, had a film in our festival here, I think it was 2009, uh, or uh, it was The Last Truck the um, closing of a GM plant, and that film, they were not able to come, so we've been trying to lure them here for years. Uh, that film was nominated for a, um, an Academy Award. Um, it had a fantastic reception here at the festival. They sent a representative down who came back and told them what an amazing festival Ashland was. But just to make sure they came this year, we created a kind of a mini Bognar Reichert fest within this fe festival. Uh, there are three films that, um, one that they made together, um, that they directed together, Making Morning Star, and um, two short films that Stephen Bognar uh, directed and uh, Julia produced, uh, The Last Reel and Foundry Night Shift. And all three of those films are on a program called Art Docs. Okay, I highly recommend it. So just, um, uh, what, th there are many other films that Stephen uh, has been involved with. His first film, uh, Personal Belongings, uh, premiered at Sundance, was on POV, and uh, Lion in the House, co-directed with Julia um, from 2007, uh, got a primetime Emmy, a, um, a extremely accomplished filmmaker. We're thrilled that he's here to moderate today's program. Steve. Thank you, Richard. It's an honor to be here. We have... So, Julia, my partner in film and life, we've been hearing about this festival for years. Every documentary filmmaker we run into says, you've got to go to Ashland, you've got to go to Ashland. So it's a thrill to be here. And even last night, we can already see why, even though we just got in. And it's a great honor to be here with two amazingly kick-ass filmmakers who also are, like, eminent legends in this field. <laughs> uh, their years may be ticking up, but their spirits are very hungry and it's a beautiful thing to be here with you both. Uh, and we're going to talk about how they each co-created these collectives, these co-ops, where they worked with their friends, sometimes their lovers, sometimes their ex-lovers, uh, to, to, to get to make films and get them out into the world and try to have a, uh, a social impact. So, but before we dive in, quick survey of hands. Who, who here is involved in film? making or, or media making documentary? Okay. 
And then a separate question, who's here in, in a co-op or in a collective of any kind, whether it's film or beer or whatever? Yeah, okay, all right, good. So um, this is sort of the meeting of those two kind of realms, right? And we're gonna sort of grapple with some of the challenges and issues. And the amazing thing is, Gordon Quinn with Cartemquin Films and Julia Reichert with New Day Films, they were the, the start of something from many years ago that both of which are still thriving today. And how, later on, we're gonna get into like, how did they do that? How did it sustain like that? So Gordon Quinn is a, um, a legend in the documentary world. He's a filmmaker of many, many films. You can, he's one of the filmmakers of Chicago Maternity Center Story, which is playing here. But his film, he's been making films for a long time. He's the executive producer here of three other films on beauty. Uh, the secret screening that, that that is playing and in the game, uh, he's executive. He's one of the producers of Hoop Dreams. Uh, made a wonderful film about the uh, co-made a wonderful film about Bill T. Jones. Amazing film uh, called a, a Good Man. Wonderful. Anyway, a legend, a winner of the IDA Lifetime Achievement Award, winner of Cinematography Prize at Sundance. The list goes on and on. Julia Reichert is a three-time Academy Award nominee. Uh, her first film, which was a student film she made at Antioch College, has been uh, accepted into the National Film Registry by the Library of Congress as a, as a historically significant film. It's probably the only student film to be on that eminent list, along with you know every other important movie. Uh, and her films include A Lion in the House, which won the Primetime Emmy, and The Last Truck, which, which screened here uh, in, in 2009, 2010. And, and also, her earlier films that were nominated for Oscars, Union Maids, which is about uh, women in the labor movement in the 1930s in Chicago, rousing film, and Oscar nominee, and Seeing Red, Stories of American Communists, which uh, was the first film where many people who had been communist and been keeping that quiet suddenly spoke, finally spoke out. Wonderful film, another rousing movie. So it's great to be here with you both. So here's how we're, we're thinking of doing it. We're gonna, uh, I'm gonna ask each of you, Gordon and Julia, to kind of tell us why you wanted to work in a kind of collective or cooperative way and how it got started. And we'll hear from each of you. And then we have a couple of clips to show from each, from Julia and Gordon. Uh, and then we're gonna keep it going, talk about the, the nuts and bolts and we'll get the juicy gossip too. So, all right, so I'm, I'm gonna start. But I have to say, Gordon is the, is, we consider him in the independent film world to be our secular rabbi. Like, he's who we go to for advice. He's the deep thinker who understands the Torah, you know, whatever the, the written things or the unwritten things about what it means to be an independent filmmaker. Gordon is the keeper of the flame and a very old friend. I wish my parents could hear that because I never was bar mitzvah. I actually, right. <laughs> I refused my bar mitzvah. He started at 12. Um, so, yeah. So I'm going to talk about New Day Films, which did come out of the women's movement. And many of you remember that, looking at the crowd, right? Uh, so just for those, so you remember the very late 60s, early 70s. I, was, I graduated college in 1970. Um, you remember, there was, if you wanted to get contraception and you weren't married, forget about it. If you needed an abortion, totally forget about it. Equal pay for equal work, nobody ever talked about that. Uh, you know, this is before, like women, if they wanted to get their own bank account, if they were married, they couldn't do it. Uh, it actually, we're coming right out of the period when there were male jobs listed in the newspaper and female jobs listed in the newspaper, right? Just to give you who weren't there a little picture of what life was like for women back then. So we were, I was part of what we called the women's liberation movement. We didn't call it the feminist movement back then. We called it the women's liberation movement for a reason. We knew we wanted to be liberated women, but we actually didn't know what that meant. Because what did it mean? And then we had to work that out over a number of years and that may come back. The women's liberation movement very much came out of this civil rights movement. I want to give a picture of sort of the backdrop, really for both of us, um, as young people wanting to figure out what to do with our lives. I'm going to give a backdrop, for, for me at least. Civil rights movement, anti-war movement, 
Uh, and then women started realizing that we were not being treated equally. And that, you know, in, in order to really change the world, the lives of women, the roles of women, the sexism out there, the patriarchy out there had to be changed. So we, um, we realized that where could we find actual women's lives depicted? Where could we see that? Uh, where were our real lives being represented? Not on television, not in magazines, not in newspapers, not in feature films, none of that. There were no women. They were all, all these images were created by men. All of them, okay? And by white middle class men, or upper middle class men, actually. So um, we had to learn, we, we realized, those of us who were kind of interested in photography, film, radio, that sort of thing, we had to learn how to do it ourselves, right? We couldn't just let it be to the men to say who we are. So one of the things very early on um, I figured is that just depicting the real life of a woman or women was in and of itself a radical act. Okay, so speaking of radical, uh, there was obviously a lot of thinking about how to change society back then. And many of us felt, I was among them, that capitalism was um, kind of the source of the problem. It wasn't necessarily actually necessarily men, although yes, patriarchy, it wasn't necessarily, you couldn't put a band-aid on the problems that we saw in the world. You had to really change the whole system. So we became kind of revolutionary thinkers, right? We read Marx, we read Mao, we did all that. I consider myself a socialist feminist. Uh, we felt we couldn't have liberation under capitalism and we wanted to fight to change the system. A little bit like Bernie, I mean, Bernie is one of us, right? All right, yeah. <laughs> Bernie is one of us, and we want to create a new society. So that's our philosophical framework for New Day. So let me use another word that you may remember, alternative institutions, right? We, we thought, let's prefigure the world we want to see, right? We want to have institutions that are not based on capitalist models, that are not based on um, patriarch patriarchal models. That is to say, you know, not hierarchical, we don't necessarily want to have clear leaders. We don't necessarily want to um, trust experts because the experts were all men. So we had to think, okay, we don't really want experts. We want to learn how to do things ourselves. So alternative institutions were things like food co-ops, alternative schools. Uh, and this is getting into like the things that are around today. It's, they were a little bit different. Alternative schools for our kids, women's centers, alternative bookstores, cooperative living, women's auto mechanics, co all kinds of crazy things that were non-hierarchical. Everyone learned, each one teach one, was one of our kind of philosophies, right? Um, so the whole notion of, of co-ops, of doing things in a shared way, an equal way, actual democracy, not what we perceived to be American democracy, which was not really very democratic. Um, so, um, we so, so I'll go back to, how did I make a film? Maybe I'll go back to that before getting into New Day itself. I was a senior in college, said all, all the things that I saw around and decided to make a film about women, uh, made in Southwest Ohio. Uh, it was called Growing Up Female. It just fo basically followed, you're going to see a tiny clip of it later, but it basically followed the lives of six women of different ages, starting at four and going to 35, which at that point I thought is the end of the road for women. <laughs> 35, right? <laughs> it was like as old as you could possibly get. Um, I was only 22, I think, at that time. So, so I made that film a senior project, 50 minute film, 5-0, long ambitious film, black and white, you know, made on no money at all. At that time, there was an organization out there nationally called Newsreel. Some of you may remember it. It was a left wing media collective all across the country that not only made films, but got them out to audiences, took them to schools, took them to picket lines, took them to labor unions. You know, they were, again, a, had the same kind of left wing philosophy we got to change the system. We got to do it from the bottom up. We got to reach regular people. We can't trust the congressmen and so forth. They were mostly all men. Um, 
So we thought, well, we'll, see, we'll give it to Newsreel when we finish it. And they'll get it out to all these great places. Well, we showed it to Newsreel and they utterly rejected it because they said it was like bourgeois, you know, it was terrible. Oh, we were really deflated. So we thought, that was a big shock in my life. Um, we thought, okay, we'll take it to a regular distributor. You know, distributors of films. And they, they saw the film. Actually, Jonas Mikas, you probably don't remember that name, but he's actually the one who helped us. We went to New York, you know, and that's where you go if you want to get a film distributed. So he set up a meeting with us with a kind of a very progressive distributor. I think it was called Vanguard Press or something like that. And we sat down at a lunch in, in the village, and there was espresso, and there was, it was really good food. I remember the bill was like $12, and I was shocked. Um, so then we brought, they brought out, they were very interested in the film and all they were going to do for it. And then they brought out the contract. And this was me and my partner Jim at the time, my partner Jim Klein. We made that film together. Uh, so we looked at the contract and it said, well, we had to sign on the dotted line for seven years. Okay, we have no, we have control over advertising. It's a film called Growing Up Female. The advertising could go in different ways. Oh, no, 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 we'll take care of that, honey, don't worry. Uh, well, what about if like a women's prison wants to see the film or a high school? They don't really have the kind of rates that you charge. Well, if they don't have money, they don't get to see the film. I mean, we are in it for a profit. So suddenly we're going, wait a minute, we made this film to help the movement grow. We made this film as almost like a tool of social change, right? So are we going to sign on the dotted line? No. So once again, on the other side, we... Um, we had nowhere to go. So, okay, what's the next thing? You do it yourself. Just like so many people were learning to do things. You know, like women were learning how to fix cars, and you know, people were learning many things. So we said, okay. So we got help again through Jonas and other people. We learned about how to distribute films. Okay. Um, so we did it with Growing Up Female. This was 16 millimeter film prints, big clunky things that had to be sent through the mail and so forth. But it kind of worked. Uh, we d we traveled. I traveled around on a Greyhound bus to various cities with the one print of the film and gathered addresses. Right, had a little showing in somebody's living room, a little showing in some high school, a little showing in a church basement. Gathered all the names, and once we amassed a bunch of names, this is way before you know we used those carbon three th three piece carbon things. I mean, we didn't even have mim uh, you know Xerox. <laughs> anyway, did mailing tons of orders, it was working. So we thought, okay, let's make, we should invite other people into this. So we met two other filmmakers, Leanne Brandon and Emily Rothschild, each of whom had just finished a film. One was on the very controversial topic of abortion. It was the first film, it's called It Happens to Us. Terrific film, by the way. It Happens to Us, it's still relevant. And Leanne made a short called Anything You Wanna Be little acted film about how girls can be anything they want to be, right? So you'll see a little clip of that. So we decided to get together and um, pool our resources, and that is how New Day was born in 1972 as a co-op. And again, our goals, we were really pretty clear on our philosophical underpinnings. It was going to be democratic. There was not going to be a president. Jim and I, even though we started it, we're going to have an equal voice to Leanne and Emily and whoever else was going to join us. We were there to reach new audiences. We were there to help the movement grow. Um, and we were going to be flexible in our pricing. Uh, and we were going to be a co-op and invite other people in. So that is how, I think that's it. That's how we got started. So there's a lot of common themes. Uh, but I think there are some, you know, we, we, the, the story is a bit different, and the period of history is a bit different by a few years. So I'm, I got interested in film at the University of Chicago. Uh, there was no film courses to speak of, certainly no production courses now. One of the people from our collective, Judy Hoffman, is a professor of film teaching production at the University of Chicago. So I go to, down to CBS and I say, gee, I'd like to, you know, I'm excited by 
film and media, and you know, I, I, you know, I think I want to work for you guys. And they explained to me that there was two routes in, in that era. Uh, I could either join the union and become a cameraman, because I was already starting to shoot, or I could become a journalist and a, and a writer and go down that road, and the two should never meet. They never, you know, they're totally different hats. Well, that wasn't going to work for me. So, and I think the, the underlying message here, uh, how Cartempo came into being was a lot more just serendipity in certain kinds of ways and what was happening. Uh, but there were a couple of other guys at the University of Chicago, a Carter uh, and a Temner, thus our unfortunate choice of name, Kartemkin, which we thought sounded like Potemkin, the famous Russian movie, worst choice ever. And then when uh, my producing partner of many years, uh, Jerry Blumenthal, joined, who passed away last year, we weren't going to change the name to Kartemkin Fall. We drew the line finally. Um, but we started this little film company. And what we wanted to do, we were coming out of, you know, studying philosophy and literature and had been incredibly excited by cinema verite and by what the Maisels brothers, uh, Leacock and Pennybaker, Drew Associates, uh, and the French, uh, Jean Rouge, Chronicle of Summer, those films. So that's, I saw some of those films. I saw Happy Mother's Day. It's like, that's what I want to do. That's what I want to do for the rest of my life. And we sort of published our early manifesto called Cinematic Social Inquiry, uh, coming out of the first draft of that, uh, which was a two-page statement, I think. It's almost incomprehensible. It's written in University of Chicago academic ease. But it later was adapted and, and expanded into something that's actually accessible and uh, was published, uh, I think they took it out of the current versions, but a book called Visual Anthropology that they still teach with. Um, and we made our first film, Home for Life, about uh, an old age home. And the, the, pretty much a verite film, a straight ahead verite film. And what we saw was we, we came out of the civil rights movement, we'd been involved in civil rights, we were, as Julia described, everybody in that era, we were all, Bernie Sanders was in my class at the University of Chicago. I sat in with him in the president, you've seen the thing circulating, and by the way, the, the footage of Bernie being arrested and thrown into a paddy wagon was in our footage from something else, from the 63 boycott. 63boycott.com, go to the blog, you can hear the whole stories. We got a million hits the day we put it up from this civil rights story that I only got about a thousand hits for. So, you know, so we, um, we make Home for Life and we wanted to change the conversation about how the elderly are treated in our society. It was in a nursing home. It was, you know, we, we and what, ha what we saw was that that's not what the film did. Everyone took the film and said, we can make nursing homes better. But no one was talking about what would be a fundamentally different solution. And when I saw that, I began to see, you know, we, we left something out of that movie. We didn't think about power relationships. And it's not enough to just reflect society back on itself. And right around, you know, after we'd finished that and we were doing, we were always doing other things to earn a living. We, we did a lot of, uh, and the, part of the reason I think we're still here 50 years later, I started with a lot of people who were like, we're going to make commercials and then do the things we want to do. We're going to make a lot of money. We took a different path. We said, we're the crew. We're going to hone our skills. We will work for the people making the corporate video, making industrials or commercials, whatever you want. We will make it look good and sound good, and we will edit it for you if that's what you need. But it's not our job. We didn't sell it. And so we never had the furniture. We never had the clothes. We never traveled in the circles where you sell those things. And we didn't get distracted from our core vision. But we were doing a lot of work at that time, and we had some we, were, we, we did have some money that we were going to be able to put into projects. And these two women show up at, at Cartemquin, who were right out of the women's uh, liberation movement. They, they were later very involved in the women's liberation, Chicago, libera Chicago Women's Liberation Union. And 
they had started a film called the Chicago Maternity Center Story, which is going to show here. And they were looking for help on their film. Uh, they had had a little bit of schooling in filmmaking, but they kind of knew that we were working at a, at a sort of technically at a, at a higher level. So now we're working with Jenny and Sue, then Richard Schmeeken, uh, an editor around town who, after he left Cartempwin many years later, went on to make the Trials of Harvey Milk. People started to join to come around. Peter Kuttner, who came out of Newsreel, came around. Jenny had actually been in another version of Newsreel in Chicago. Jenny Roy. Jenny Roy. Yeah. Sue Davenport. Uh, yeah. And so it was just the late 60s. It was like, oh yeah, I guess maybe we should be a collective. And so we started, we sort of came into being. You'll see the, the clip that I'm showing is not clips from the movies we were making, but clips from a reunion about 10 or 15 years ago where we got some of the people from the collective together. We, you'll see we're all very talented at talking at the same time. And you know, but some of these people that I'm mentioning are, are in that uh, clip and, and a couple people talk about how they came uh, to Cartemplin. And so, you know, our, what we were and what we were trying to do was something, now that we were a group, we were sort of now had to figure out what that was. Unlike New Day, which had this vision, I think, right from the start, we were like, okay, now as this group that wants to make films, we had certain core values. We wanted to uh, do skill sharing. Uh, you know, a lot of the people in the group were people who had been teachers or union organizers. They really weren't filmmakers. Uh, many of them were women. And so we were very aggressive about sharing the skills, taking people out on shoots, uh, and trying to give them kind of the basic filmmaking skills. Uh, we were concerned about craft, and we tended to be working very closely at that time because of where some of our members came from with other organizations in Chicago. The Chicago Women's Liberation Union, Rising Up Angry, which was working with gang kids, uh, and other kind of unions. Uh, and so we would tend to develop our projects with these organizations to help them do what they saw as their vision of what they began to do. And we were pretty provincial in those early years. And then we began to see, oh, well, there does seem to be lots of other organizations in other cities uh, that are doing this. And so we would start, we are then start trying to distribute our films and eventually to get them on television, on public television. The first films that we got on national broadcast were un films about union issues. Uh, and we actually, uh, Chicago Maternity Center film was a New Day film. We saw what they were doing was like, yes, that's, that works perfectly for us. And Jenny was very active in New Day for a while. So, and we spent a lot of time in what we would call the, these endless movies, I think they may be referred to in the clip, structure and identity, because we were really endless meetings. What did I say? Endless meetings. Okay, Beauty, movies, meetings, they're not that different, because, to be, and this is, a, I'm digressing for a moment, but something that has always been very important to Car Templin is democratic process seeing people actually engage in the activities that are going to have consequences in their lives and their communities. And so some of our early films, and I, I, people say, oh, that's just talking heads, or that's just a meeting. And I say, that's, a meeting can be as dramatic as anything else. Talking heads can be as dramatic as anything else. It's what are people saying and how do you tell the story? So one of our early films is about uh, labor negotiations. We were the first ones in the U.S. to film actual labor going on Taylor Chain 2 between the company and the union. And it sounds really boring, but it isn't. And so I think that was, you know, we wanted people to see what democracy looks like and where people participated in America, which for us was in the PTA, was in a union, was in other kinds of community organizations, not necessarily the voting booth. Um, so, okay, am I at the, I'm done. That's, uh, okay.
Yeah. I, yeah, I just, yeah, I just, I just want to add one detail. I'll come back. Okay. So we're going to look at two clips. Uh, which should we start with? Uh, does it matter? Okay. Yeah, if we could turn off the lights, that'd be great. first one is going to be the first three New Day films I mentioned, but tiny little clips from them uh, of eight minutes. All together, if you saw them all together, it would be like an hour and 15 minutes. And our clip is just three minutes from this reunion from about 15 years ago. She was created from the substance of fairy tales and magazines, history books and television, romance comics and bridal shops. The American Woman. By the time a girl is four, she already has learned many of the rules of being female. Girls have become little mothers, cooking and cleaning for their doll children. While the boys are out earning a living, busily building tunnels and bridges with their toy trucks. The girls will usually be in the dog corner playing their mother roles. <laughs> and uh, I, I think I see less closeness with girls, the relationships, the friendships. If a girl comes to school with a new haircut, the other girls tend to be jealous. We don't like you because you have new shoes and we don't have new shoes or something like that. This, this is true, I think, of females, period. That they, they have these little ways about them that are nasty. I, I really think they are nasty. I really do. I will follow him. This is probably the first year that she's really ever owned blue jeans. I don't know, I guess I'm a little old fashioned. I think little girls should wear uh, dresses and look like little girls. She's always complaining that she buys me brand new dresses and everything. I never wear them. I can't do as much in a dress because now that good weather's come, we like to play outside and play tag and kickball. And you can't do them. Now, Cindy Jones is operating the uh, key punch now. It requires a very sedate type of individual. Somebody who is high strung, I don't believe, could stand at that in one position and keep on day in, day out. Would you say that, that the female students are more adept at this? Female students are definitely more adept at uh, key punching. For anything beyond the, the key punch, I would prefer male students. Industry takes men for this, you know, the primary reason. The woman's going to work just a couple of years, and then bingo, she's going to get married and have a family. The very nature of a woman is such that it uh, makes her wish to, wishing to get married. Well, how are you, Teresa? Okay. Well, I thought I'd come Every young you. woman in Terry's high school is required to take a six-week course from her guidance counselor on the subject of marriage. The husband should make the major decisions. The wife should assist, maybe, if he asks his, her advice. But the major decisions are his. Also, I believe that a wife should not expect the husband to do any housework, like wash dishes, clean the house. Because a young man now has to be working in a competitive field. And this competition is so great that if he is not striving constantly for perfection, in his area, then he will not really be a successful man in later years. So therefore, I think all these menial tasks should be taken care of by the woman. And when I say menial, I mean like doing the laundry, taking care of the washing, the baby's diapers, and so forth. And in this way, you are helping him to be a healthy, happy, successful man.
when I was a little girl, I wanted to be a lot of things. I wanted to be a cowboy, a fireman, a mommy, a doctor. My parents bought me dolls. They said I could be anything I wanted to be when I grew up. So when I got to high school, I decided to be class president. go into something less complicated. I decided... Well, about eight years ago, I got pregnant the first time. Um, I didn't have contraception available to me because at that point in Knoxville, Tennessee, where I'm from, I was born and raised there, they weren't dispensing any birth control methods or information just to uh, single people, particularly women. I didn't get an abortion because I have a sister that I'm very close to who didn't want me to die from an abortion. And we both knew most of the people available in our town were butchers. That was the reason I chose to have the child and give it up for adoption. If abortion had been legal, or if you had known that there were safe, illegal abortions, would you have had an abortion and taken that risk? And yes, I would, because I got pregnant the second time. And I had an abortion during my 22nd Christmas, a year later. It was an illegal abortion. I chose to have it because I would have killed myself rather than give up a child. He came to my apartment. It was very clandestine. I had to check and see nobody saw him. He boiled the instruments on the stove. And on newspaper, on the bed, with a couple of pills that made me woozy, but very aware of what was going on. With my legs hanging over the edge of the bed, he scraped out the uterus after dilating me. And I have very sensitive uterus, and it was agonizing. I couldn't scream or let out any sounds because then someone would come to find out what had happened. And I could hear the tissue falling from the uterus to the floor on the newspaper. Oh, I didn't get any antibiotics. And later I started having problems. And I called him. He came back a second time. Scraped me out again. And I spent Christmas night on the couch at my sister's house in such pain that I had to bite my lip until I drew blood to keep from screaming. I think it would be fair to state that the women who most often have suffered are first our poor sisters and next our young sisters. We would like to listen to their reasoning. Those in power that deny young women the safety of contraception and the right to abortion. For we are in awe of their ability to make way for so much unhappiness and chaos in our lives. Okay, so those are the first clips from the first three New Day films. And Emily Rothschild's film that you saw at the beginning of there um, was you know, obviously incredibly controversial, and I don't think it, I don't think it could have had a distributor if we didn't decide to do it together and to really get behind it. And it was widely, widely used uh, for a long time, and I'm really proud of that. It was, you know, it made a difference. And this was be before it was legal, except it became legal in New York State briefly before it became legal in Roe v. Wade. Okay. 
and yeah, those right, and that, those films need to get out still today. Okay, so now I'm going to switch to Kartempkin films. The collective, in my memory, kind of grew up sort of naturally. People just sort of, it was what was happening in the time. You would sort of say, oh, there's a person that maybe shares these underlying values. Tell me what, tell me what, tell me what. Mm, why can't we you know, together? most of the women in this room, and especially Suzanne and I, came out of a politics and out of the Chicago Women's Liberation Union. I was politicized through um, this collective process that I had kind of fallen into. I was in the right place at the right time. You and fell into the basement. I fell the into the basement. <laughs> <laughs> and there were these two guys, Jerry and Jordan, who, this is from my point of view, um, had this business that they really didn't want to take care of. They didn't want to do any of the business stuff. They wanted to make political films that would have an impact, that would change the world, that would organize people. You were part of something that was bigger than you were. And Cartaglin really provided that kind of a base for people. And um, I mean, that's sort of like the microcosmic idea of it. You were making the movies, you were doing the organizing, but you were part of a group, and that group right. sort of like exfoliated in a way to the larger society right. and and to social change and so forth. Exfoliated and pretty good. Yeah, wow. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I don't know if there's ever been a process of writing narration that got more attention and more hours than the way that we would go and our cuts and the way we we, we would you know, someone would edit, but you'd bring, or two people would edit together, and then you'd bring a, a cut or a scene to the group, and we'd, you know, work it over like gangbusters. And it was an entrepreneurial um, spirit that we now, under, and I would say it is social entrepreneurial. Well, all that, not, we our, not because we were entrepreneurial, <laughs> but because we actually, yeah. we, we did yeah, all that sure. because we actually yeah. wanted to be able to support ourselves to make the films that were important. But that is not We would you know. read yeah. an article every week, and we would come back and we would discuss it. It's Chairman Moore. And this one has the of Chairman Moore. Here's the headline. The specialist. But we should tell them that no revolutionary writer or artist can do any meaningful work unless he is closely linked with the masses gives expression to their thoughts and feelings, and serves them as a loyal spokesman. Serve the we people. We were trying to make a revolution. To the people. We were trying to make a revolution. The Little Red Book, right there. That's amazing. Okay, if we can get the lights back on. That was put... That was put together by uh, Nancy McDonald, who's on staff now, but was a former intern. It's, yeah, that's great to see. So uh, now we're going to get into uh, how it worked. And, uh, and then pretty soon we're going to throw it open to you, you know, in terms of questions. And uh, we'll make this more of a dialogue. But really, if you could be specific about certain ground rules you had. Uh, was it truly democratic? Did that work? Did that not work? Uh, and what about the interpersonal stuff of like you were some of you were in relationships with each other and did that complicate things? Uh, and Julia, I, I like Julia. So Julia co-created New Day Films, which is a nationwide distribution uh, co-op. But you also lived in a collective, and Cartempton was a collective. Is a is was a collective. But you lived in a living collective of filmmakers, and if you could talk about that a little bit too. So once we were this thing that we called the collective, and there's a, a core of the people, there were others, um, we, 
we were heavily influenced by the Women's Liberation Union uh, and the women's movement because we had so many people from that. And so we had a very democratic process. We would have these two meetings a week, structure and identity meetings, uh, which is what we call them because we were trying to figure out what we were and how we operated. And there would be rotating chairs. Uh, when they were talking about these sessions where we'd bring them in for critique, I remember that we were, you know, Jerry and I, my exfoliating uh, partner there, uh, th there was a lot of, you know, you guys have to say something good before you say, you know, get critical. Uh, and so there was a culture that grew up within Cartempoin that was very influenced by the women's movement. Um, I was sharing with Julia earlier, and so we were, we were not an economic collective. What we were trying to do was to give people the skills to be able to have their own careers in film. And at first, you know, being hyper-democratic, uh, everybody wanted to learn everything. So we were teaching everybody everything, and we would bring people on these commercial jobs, and we would get a lot of pushback. People would say, hey, she doesn't know the job. You know, what do you, you know, why did you bring her? What's going on here? And so then we moved to people have to specialize. You know, who wants to really do camera? Who wants to do audio? Who, who wants to be the editor? Uh, and... So that was kind of our model, which lasted for about, you know, the late 60s till the end of the 70s. And I think ultimately it, it, part of the reason that it did dissolve, uh, it just sort of people gradually left because we weren't making a living. Money that we would make from these jobs, we would put, you know, whatever we made that was kind of like profit or extra money would go into this common fund that they, we would then use for our projects. And we also actually were beginning to discover the world of grants and realize there was a little bit of money to be gotten out there and we started uh, to do that. Um, during that same period, I think we also got involved to be much more aggressive about reaching wider markets than just the activists that we knew with our films. Uh, you know, and I, I was talking with Julia earlier about the limitations of democracy that we were learning about. And there was a dramatic moment in our group, and I remember it was like, we had no, our early films, when you look at them, there were, there were lots of films that had no titles on them. It would just say the Cartempoin Collective. And then the younger, we had the, the younger, less powerful people, less experienced people in the group, were very vocal. And they said, this is bullshit. You guys all have credits on films. We don't have any. We want to see our name up there. On so then we started putting credits on the film. And the most dramatic moment was a little bit later in, in our collective history when it was like Sharon, who wasn't really, didn't come out of politics, but she was always around. She was always coming on and then another woman. And they, and they were sort of saying, this democratic leadership is bullshit. There are leaders in this group. There are people who are providing leaders, but leadership, but they're unacknowledged. And therefore, we can't hold you accountable. And it was just one of those moments where we really understood they're right. There are leaders, particularly at that time, Jenny and I were taking a lot of leadership. And it was like, we need to, we didn't actually take on titles, but we needed to acknowledge that and acknowledge the fact that we had a responsibility to be held accountable for the kind of leadership we pr provided. So I think that's kind of how we, you know, the, the other note I would make that has to do with, I think, well, I'll come back to that. It's like why we're here 50 years later. That's the, how the collective operated. Yeah, and I could, yeah, and we're still here 50 years later. And, or 47 years later, we're not quite 50 yet. And by the way, New Day now has like well over 100 filmmakers, and, and it's national. It always was national. Where you, you guys started as really Chicago-based, like we were, the media We were houses. provincial. Yeah. yeah, we were too, as our living collective. The, we called it the Media House in Dayton, Ohio. That was an experiment in small-c communism, really, or communalism, I guess. You know, it's interesting that we were all trying to figure out, like, what is real democracy? Because we were not raised, you're not really raised, and probably less so now. Other than, like, you vote or you go door to door for your candidate, what is really democracy on a people level, on a grassroots level? What are we trying to achieve as a society? So I think we were all 
trying to kind of hammer that out in our own experience. So I was give I could give you, a, I would like to tell you a few things about New Day. Keeping in mind, it was a distribution group that came from all over the country. We did not make films together. We, our goal was to get them to audiences. Okay, but there are expenses involved and there are tasks involved. And so as a co-op, we shared the expenses originally equally, and we also shared the tasks. And people, and this has continued all these years. Um, in the beginning, we did not have any kind of leadership structure. It was just, we were all, every voice heard, which, which really didn't work after a while, kind of like for you two. So uh, the tasks, for instance, okay, you have to design a catalog. You know, we have lots of, every year we had to put out a catalog. Well, who's gonna design that? Every year we had to figure out, like, who are we gonna send the catalog to? Every year we had to figure, like, how are we gonna get mailing lists? Who's gonna take care of the, you know, whatever, tasks. So people who were more drawn to, like, design would take on, you know, so people took tasks depending upon their interests and, that's still, and their skills, and that's still true. Um, and there's a person who is the taskmaster whose job it is to make sure everybody's doing their tasks. And that was something we realized we needed in order to make this kind of egalitarian. Everyone share the work. In terms of the money, um, so money comes in uh, to a central place because there's a central distribution place actually in New Jersey where it's, it's like a fulfillment house, right? They send out stuff. Our, our, well, in those days, VHS, then DVDs, etc. So a certain amount is taken away for the expenses, for printing the catalog, for paying the staff who does the fulfillment and all that. All the rest goes to the filmmaker. So every month you get a statement uh, with, and a check, which is really great. So you get all the profit, um, which is very different from a normal distributor where you really have no idea <laughs> who's getting your film and you only get a 20% or whatever. The, there came to be a problem though, as time went on, oops, this is one of the challenges we had to face, is that certain films were really huge sellers. They were actually made to be huge sellers. And others were great films, but they didn't have a big audience, but we still wanted to support them. So one of the things we came up with was a share ladder, where people who earned more paid more, and people who earned less paid less. And people who first were coming into the co-op, where they have a lot of expenses, um, we made them at the lowest share ladder. So, you know, there were lots of structural things like that that we, um, that we came up with. Uh, I guess in terms of this, um, oh, you use the word ultra-democracy or maybe, anyway. As the co-op grew, you know, we took more and more people into the co-op. Got bigger and bigger, 12, 15, 20 people sitting around a room for several days trying to make decisions for the whole year. Well, that gets difficult. And also, certain people have louder voices or are more confident, uh, and their voices are heard more, and they influence the decisions more. And that was causing factionalism and stuff that would have driven the co-op to pieces. So we decided to bring in what's, what are known as kind of facilitators. So we brought in, after a number of years, we brought in facilitators who actually worked with us the entire year, who facilitated the meetings, who made sure everybody's voice was heard, who made sure votes were taken at the right time, who made sure tasks were given out, who were themselves, again, not members of the co-op, right? So that was actually terrific. I, I actually want to give one more little example of a real big turn, turn in the road. There were lots of them, lots of reinventions of what we were. New Day started out to be films about and by women, right? However, there always was Jim Klein, my partner, which is always a little weird. He was used, used to be referred to as J period Klein <laughs> whenever there was publicity. But at one point, um, there was a really good film came along called Men's Lives that was made by men and it was like growing up female, only it was about growing up as a, as a guy. What are your influences, you know, and so forth. So we really, really, really had to have deep discussion about this. Could we have male filmmakers and I just want to read you from our, this is a catalog from the early years, just a short piece here. Um, from lengthy discussions of our concept of what is a feminist film, we came to feel that feminism is not the domain of women or women's issues alone. To us, it's much broader. 
As feminists, we are attempting to transform all of society, from daily relationships between people to social, political, and economic institutions. The lives of both women and men need to be changed. So we made this big decision. And we op New Day has always been and remains much more women filmmakers. And, and the leadership um, has turned over many times. Uh, and it's always been predominantly women. That's something I'm very proud of, is that me, let's say I started New Day, me and Jim. But I was only in the leadership for a certain number of years. Younger, a next generation came in, a next generation, I think that's been true of Clark Templin as well. Um, and that's something that's been hard for I think a lot of 60s institutions, is that there's one leader who kind of, you guys are nodding, you may know examples like that. We really focused on uh, reinventing ourselves for new times and, and bringing new people into, into leadership. That's another part of democracy. Not just a few well-known, thoughtful leaders who came up with the idea, but we have to be able to transform it again and again generationally. So. But, um, so Gordon, you mentioned that eventually you got called on, like there had to be structural leadership. Um, what did you do, and did it did it work at first? And Julia, you should talk about the steering committee concept too. Yeah, I, I I think it did work, and you know it was really more important that we acknowledge it. So we didn't have titles or anything. We did have like kind of a steering something. I forgot what we called it now, but we had something like that. But I think the the other thing that I think, you know, when Julia was talking, I was thinking about. You know, there, there, occasionally Cartemquin would be referred to as a feminist collective because the women were so visible and, you know, and we were written up that way. Uh, you know, it was like, well, well, well what, you know, uh, what about us? And, and, but what I think we're getting at is one of the th values of the women's liberation movement and that influenced so many organizations was this idea of how do you do democracy? How do you actually work that out? And nobody really knew. So there was a lot of work to kind of figure that out. And I think the, the part of the reason that Cartemquin did survive is that we greatly reinvented ourselves from three guys who were going to make films to reflect back on society, its problems, to the collective to a period when we sort of, the, the, the middle period when we were doing a lot of work for unions and also seeking a broader national audience uh, with labor stories and other kinds of things. And then some young guys appeared right out of college and they had this idea for a film about kids who played basketball and dreamed of being in the NBA, which many years later became Hoop Dreams. And what we saw with Hoop Dreams was, you know, we have the ability to make people, to go draw on a, an audience, that film had a huge audience, of people who would never watch a film about a social problem. They would never watch a three hour film about quote inner city people. But they watched Hoop Dreams because it was about sports and it was about family and it's about young men coming of age. And so we began to say, maybe that's the direction, given the point in history where we were, we're always looking in and out. And we realized that's something that Cartemquin can do that I think, you know, should sort of begin to, to chart our course forward. And then about 10 years ago, I, and, I, and we had been working on this for years, we, we had many false starts because we now really were, it was me and Jerry and people who worked with us, Jenny came back for a while, especially when we were doing the union uh, films, and it was me and J Jenny and, uh, and Jerry were doing the union films. And then Jenny sort of moved to Washington and she became Cartemquin East for a while, but she took over kind of our union uh, nuts and bolts films, you know, organizing films and things like that for unions. And so as we began to evolve in this other direction, the idea was we need to reinvent our structure again. And where we landed on was becoming a not-for-profit media arts organization. And after a couple false starts, uh, about 10 years ago, I stepped down as executive director. And Justine Nagin, who's now leading POV, the, the PBS series, took over as executive director. She was a young person. And we put a lot of effort 
into changing the face of Cartemplin. So who, what does Cartemplin look like? Who speaks in public? It's our 50th anniversary, so they keep trotting me out this year, you know, and I'm, I'm you know, I mean, the, the, I, I'll see in the emails, you know, oh, the, the interns are gonna follow you around for a day. I'm like, that's a terrible idea, you know, but, um, there, you know, but we really did. We built a board, and so we look like uh, a media arts organization. We have a real board now that, you know, we had a board for many years, but it never met, you know. We, when, you know, we all form not-for-profits with boards, but we now have a real active board, and we are trying to find a way to support people who make films like the secret screening film here, Raising Bertie, which we think nobody else is going to, you know, they're hard to get made, and they're hard to get them out to an audience. One other detail that I think is, was important to our survival, because during Cartemquin's, sort of during the collective years, the Chicago Women's Liberation Union split apart in a, in a, and finally self-destructed in a, a terrible sectarian battle within the organization. And we had the leader of both, the leaders of both factions in Cartemplin. They had been best friends, now they were best of enemies. Uh, and we survived, and I think one of the reasons we survived is although we were meeting Marx and Lenin and Mao, we were very averse to and tried to keep any kind of sectarian thinking from coming into our organization. A core value was, is that people have to respect each other and respect difference. And we had, when you use the word core value, I like that, because that's some, something I was thinking of, is we always, whenever we hit a crisis, we always went back to those core values of, of how we were formed and why we were formed the way we were. You know, non-hierarchical, we're all about reaching our audience, we're broader than just women, you know, all the core, core things from the beginning. Um, I wanted to, I could mention a couple of the things you, um, you know, we got big and we decided, along with the facilitators, that we needed a steering committee. You all know, what, of course, what that is. And what that means is these are elected people, of course, from the group um, who take much more day-to-day -day responsibility. Not that they're paid or anything. This is a weird business. It's a business. But there's like no president or vice president or anything like that. There's just the co-op members, like over 100 people, who meet once a year for three or four days. And a steering committee of a smaller number, I think there's probably seven or eight, uh, who meet much more regularly by phone and then meet in person in the other half of the year. Like it's June and December or something like that. And those people are elected, so they are accountable. As Gordon referred to, it's very important the leadership be acknowledged and accountable. The other thing, we have rotating, you know, people are expected to serve for like three years, but then they rotate off. Uh, we also developed a buddy system. This is one of the ways we incorporated younger members and empowered them, is they didn't just come in and have to listen and kind of flounder around what's going on here to this co-op that's been around for 15, 20, 30 years. They get buddies who are assigned to them on their distribution, on their understanding the co-op, on their particular film, et cetera. That was something we established which, which, really, uh, which really helped. By the way, I should mention, if any of you are either filmmakers that might have a New Day type film, I put a few of these little flyers on the back. This is a little flyer from our 40th anniversary that I put on the back. Or any of you use films in your, in your work, uh, you know, please take one. So those are, those are some things. Great. Well, why don't we open it up to questions, and then, uh, yeah, we'll just keep talking. Yeah. Oh, actually, so there's a mic. I'm sorry, I have to say. And, and because we're recording it, uh, we want, it's really for the recording more than for the room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you don't have to go anywhere. The mic will come to you. OK, I, is it on? All right. Um, I just wanted to say, Julia, I so appreciated your historical account because it reflects exactly what happened here. We started a women's center. We started introduction to women's studies. We used union maids. We used growing up female. 
It's so powerful to hear that account and to remember. And uh, one of the things, of course, that did get left out, uh, and it's not a criticism because it was an evolutionary process, was um, the domestic and sexual violence movement. And that was really key here. And, you know, it began with a series of workshops. And women came out from, just like the abortion movement, they came out from under the, just the woodwork. So that historical account is so powerful. I'm looking around the room a little bit to see some gray hairs. See if somebody here remembers our own history. But of course, it was at Southern, Southern Oregon University. And that history is alive and well, because we still have those centers. But thanks again for that account. Well, thank you for saying that. And it makes me remember that um, as if you, if you look back, speaking of history, if you look back at even the receipts from Growing Up Female, you can watch the women's movement growing. Like the first year, it's like Brandeis and Columbia University and Radcliffe and, you know, that kind of thing. And it's Boston and New York and Cleveland. And then the next year, it begins to get to, you know, state schools. And then the next year, community colleges and women. And after several years, it begins to go into the South. Right? The women's movement finally makes it to the South. Um, so you, it's, you know, it, it was, it was a, it was a, it was a prairie fire movement, actually, to me, the women's liberation movement, but it was a slow growing prairie fire reflecting the nature of the United States. So I don't know when, when did it start, when did the Women's Center start here? 1974. Okay. Fairly early on. Actually, that was more the introduction to women's studies. It was uh, 76, and we're about to have our 40th anniversary. Okay. And then 77 for the first shelter for battered women and their children. First, thank you. What you did to anchor the social change component in film as it moved forward through history. It's, um, and the question I have has to do with because it has exploded now. We have documentaries everywhere, and it, it worked. There's, um, I'm curious about how, what you've learned about social change in terms of whether we're just raising awareness or how you move an audience to action, especially because it's exploded and you have an information fatigue or that, that, that sort of overload that leads to apathy because you've seen too much and you don't know where to start. So I'm interested in, in what you've learned about that. And thanks for talking about power relationships and your own evolution through that. I, I could say something about that. Those are such good questions. So you you first asked about uh, the, well, you, the second part is the fatigue of information. And the first part is how do you turn an aesthetic experience, let's say a film, into action? The way I've always looked upon it um, is you try to make, you try to aim your films where people in the society are in motion, right? You, you sort of just don't make a film because, oh, I'm interested in that. Uh, growing up female, you know, the women's movement was starting, union maids, the, it was starting to spread in, union maids into the labor movement and working women. Um, I mean, I could give lots of examples, but you think where in society, okay, the early environmental films, they didn't come into a vacuum. There were environmental organizations all over the country that immediately knew how to use that film. They already had the grassroots connections. You don't just throw a film out into the world and it makes social change, usually. There are examples, like Invisible War. Do you remember that film by Kirby Dick about, I use this always as an example of, you know, sexual, of rape in the military. Tremendous film. I think it might have been shown here. I don't know. That film actually ignited uh, women coming forward and the military having to finally admit that they were covering up all this stuff. But in general, my feeling is you, you, you make films and you aim them and you partner with organizations that are out there. Films themselves don't change the world, but in connection with people who are trying to change the world, organizations you can partner with, people on the grassroots level, that's where they get used. So that's where they're used. And then the, the, the second point, I think films can kind of inspire people 
and kind of rally people and make people together in a room. Now that's a little harder to get now with the internet. People together in a room coming, feeling a solidarity with each other and feeling a little more strength in the struggle for tomorrow if they see something that speaks directly to what they're concerned with. Uh, so I think films can give that emotional aesthetic experience that just sort of the average leafleting and meeting and talking, which is how social change happens, right? It can be that extra kind of emotional boost. I don't know if you agree with that, but that's, that's how I think of it. I mean, we, sure, we, we from the earliest days, you know, and we didn't call it this then, but, you know, we always have uh, outreach or uh, engagement part um, and it's something we ask film, what's your strategy for getting this used? But I also think that there's another aspect to it, which is when the Chicago Maternity Center story was made and we saw they were gonna lose their battle to keep this center open, we felt we had to broaden the context of the story and the film becomes fairly polemical. You'll see there's a driving narration and we're telling the story of the industrialization of, chi women, of childbirth and women's health care. Um, because we felt people who are going to be fighting these struggles all across the country need that information for the struggle that they're, you know, and we were like, we, we heard about a screening in Florida where, uh, you know, people watch the film and then they marched down to the local ho hospital right out of the screening for a protest. And that was, you know, we thought that was our gold standard. But there's another thing that I think is incredibly important for social change and I would say it's what we're doing now and I think there are different kinds of documentaries for different purposes. I, I, I love Michael Moore but we don't make films like Michael Moore and so when we made The New Americans which was a film for, that was one of our most strategic we were aware of it was post hoop dreams we knew that immigration was becoming a big issue we did a six part series, seven part series for public television about immigration. It's very emotional, follows families coming to America now. And we had an early interactive website where people could leave comments. And there was a certain kind of comment that kept coming up. And I think this is, what I'm talking about this, this, what we wanted was people, we wanted people to view our characters with empathy, which is different from sympathy. Empathy is, is a more equal, you know, if you're talking about power, power relationship, sympathy is saying, oh, that poor person, the power relationship is off. Empathy understands that we are the same. And we would get these comments that would say, I see where you're coming from here. You have an agenda. You want me to see that these people have families and they have hopes for their children and that they're kind of like me, you know? And you sort of did, and I resent it. And I was like, good, I'll take that. That's just what I want. Because that's a part of social change, too, which is using emotion. You know, uh, uh, we're, we can tell, look at the, you know, look what's happening now. A coherent, thought out argument with facts isn't changing people's minds. I mean, Donald Trump gave it to us straight out. I could go into the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and it would not affect my poll numbers. He understands his constituency. But empathy is a different thing. And that's, once you open people up, you get that little crack. Then you can move them to the next, next stage. And I just wanted to say one other thing about this question of power relationship, which I think is really important. And it's something we, it's a core value at Cartempwe. When young people come to me, with, and the guys came to me with hoop dreams, uh, they were right out of school and they had this idea for a half hour film. But the first thing, they were all white, and the first thing I asked them was, in some form or other, what is it that you think gives, what gives you the right to think that you're the one to make this film about these African American families? And I still ask that question. And the point of the question is not that there's an answer or an easy answer, but if you haven't thought about it, if you haven't asked the question, you're not ready to make the film yet. And so those, the, the question of who has power, who doesn't, uh, we now are paying in our field a lot of attention to ethics. And I think it's, you know, when you talk about ethics, you also have to talk about the power relationship. My question is about <clears throat> distribution models for change. The economics model or driving videos, 
to the web, download to individual devices, you see it at the cheapest possible price, which is like the perfect model against social change. Um, and I was impressed, Julia, by your comments that you went around with a 16 millimeter, showed it in living rooms and schools, and I'll be darned if that model still is not possibly the most effective model for making individuals aware. So to what extent do you see the sort of traveling minstrel model? Books are sold these days. With all the marketing of books, the thing that sells books is an author on a book tour. And if the person making the documentary is the one who has the emotional attachment, their presence has a tremendous effect on people beyond watching 26 minutes or whatever. To what extent is the personal relationship of the movie maker or a person invested in that part of the change model, even if it's economically inefficient? That's a great question. You're partly answering it, I think, by the way you've, you put it. Um, we always felt, and I still feel, that there's a cycle of what we do. There's you know, conceiving the film, making the film, finishing the film, and then there's getting it out to the audience. That is totally part of it, and I need to be at the core of all of those parts. I don't pass it off to somebody else. So in a way, I don't. You probably as well. We do a lot of personal appearances. Um, you know, that's very interesting that you say that kind of person-to-person -person model. Let's get together in my living room. Let's get together in our church. Uh, you have a feeling that would be very effective today. I don't know what you guys think about that. that. That like strikes ideas in my head. Because I think now what we're getting used to, what we're having to get used to, is people are going to stream our film on their cell phone. Or it's going to be streamed in a classroom and we'll have no idea it's going on. And, you know, economically they pay something for it. And the good part is way more people can use it streamed than they could have in the days of the 16 millimeter print. Um, but the bad part is you're, you're not there's no presence of, of you. So I just, I don't have an answer, but I think it's a really good question. Yeah. One of the things that, that when we talk about outreach and engagement, and it's, as you said, we often think, is, what is it about this film? How are, we, how are we, or how is the filmmaker gonna use this film to get people into a room together in face-to-face -face contact? That's always where I'm coming from. I still believe I'm, you know, 73, so I believe in getting people in a room. But the young people who I work with, many of them, say, well, you know, we have Facebook, we have chats, we have, they have a whole different way. They still, I think they still understand the difference. But there are other platforms that people are experimenting with that create that interactive back and forth between people who have come together around an issue. You can have your hand up in the right Hi, thank you very much. This is tremendous. It's great to hear your stories and um, histories. And um, My question is if you have um, any anecdotes or advice or thoughts on incorporating humor in difficult issues, um, kind of just sort of reel people in and for the entertainment value, you know, there's a question of you don't want to offend people by using humor sort of in the wrong place, but if you've had you know, just thoughts, advice, experience, anecdotes on, you know, that kind of incorporating difficult issues and a lightness or m a, some kind of narrative that's a hook or especially humor. Well, I'm thinking of the Gender Gap movie, which you all can see. It's a short, it's actually very funny. I was also noticing, though, I mean, yes, emotions unite us, right? Whether they be tears that we cry together, that we've seen something that unites us and this is wrong. Uh, or, well, like the woman giving her story of her abortion. I could feel the emotion in the room at the same time, and that, that unites us. That makes us, once again, say, well, i got to do something about that. Maybe that'll make us give that donation or go to that demonstration because we saw that. I believe that's true. Um, at the same time, with like in Growing Up Female, it was something pretty terrible those people were saying. The woman should be in the kitchen. She should board her man no matter what. Yeah, key punch. It's only a women's job. We all laughing. 
And people started laughing at it then, which was the initial recognition of how absurd this was. So I'm a big believer in emotion, not manipulating people's emotions, but not shying away from true emotion. In fact, I really hate when I feel my emotions are being manipulated. I think you do. We, that's something we share in our filmmaking, yeah. But yeah, humor, go see the gender gap film if you want. <laughs> but really all of our films, uh, I mean, in a film like Hoop Dreams, a film like Stevie, uh, Saving Bertie, all of these long films, there's, a, there la there's laughter. And you get very worried when you say, we didn't make a comedy, but when we're sitting in an audience and nobody's laughing, I mean, as you work with a film over time, you always know where the first laugh is. And you can tell by the first laugh how that audience is then going to perceive the rest of the film. So I think it's very important. And sometimes things that you didn't think were funny are funny. When, when I show uh, the Bill to Jones film, which is about a choreographer and his dance troupe, when I, I were like, oh, there's a lot of dancers in the room because they laugh at what nobody else laughs at. And so I think it's incredibly important. Uh, and, you know. Oh, no, I was just thinking of another thing. We, and Gordon knows this film, Steve and I together made a film called A Lion in the House, which is a four hour movie about kids fighting cancer. And it has a lot of tears and it's very wrenching in many ways. But there's also a lot of humor because the, the, the subjects are kids. And one of our colleagues, uh, who's a, an actor, said that unless your, your work in whatever form, unless you dive, you, you, you dive deep, but unless you come up for air, you can't stay on that deep level because then you can't go any deeper. But if you come up for air, i.e. you have a little light moment or you know, something that's, where you can breathe again, then you can go deeper. And I've always remembered that, I guess, now in editing. So maybe that speaks to what you're saying, too. Uh, okay, so my question is about uh, basically empowerment versus quality. Um, work with a lot of people who are dedicated to empowering people who don't have a voice in cinema uh, in various ways to make their entry. And I'm very enthusiastic about that, but at the same time, there's this challenge of, well, everyone has to take their first step. And it's not always something that you're gonna be proud of looking at later on. But how much of an audience do you want that to have if your organization is gonna survive? Um, so I was wondering like your own experiences in, in dealing with that. Well, that, that's something over the years, there, and I work with a lot of people who are making their first feature length doc. Um, and I think, you know, sometimes you're right that people have to kind of learn the craft a bit, but sometimes there are people who are coming up who like all of a sudden you're get, you know, they, they're just bringing something new to it or something fresh to it. And so I think like most things in life that are important, that's a very relevant, legitimate, and I talked a little bit about our early days when we were skill sharing and bringing people who really didn't know how to load the camera on, on as a, a, a assistant camera and people complained. But I think that tension is one that we want in our institutions and want in our society as a whole that we understand we want people to get to the highest level, and at the same time, we want to make sure that people are being supported to walk through those doors and, and get those chances, and it's, it's not a level, level playing field out there. And so, you know, there's a lot of struggles going on in America and in our field now around the question of diversity. And as I once said to a, a, a colleague who was complaining about a funder, who says, well, I'm a white guy, they're not gonna fund my movie, you know? And I was like, actually, that's not true, you know? It's just that you have to compete with these other people on a level playing field. That's all we're talking about. It, it's worth noting, too, we're in an era where film, you know, now documentaries or social media also exist in the world of film festivals where aesthetics and 
you know, quote unquote, quality are, are um, issues. And when you were starting, it was like it was all about social change. You, you know, you both seem to care a lot about making good movies. But, you, you know, now I think a media maker has, has to grapple with, yeah, if you're going to try to make an impact, it's, I mean, some people do, but it's hard to ignore um, this world of, of, like, film festivals and aestheticizing documentaries. Helen. And we're almost out of time. But. How has this practice impacted you personally in your life going backwards and going forward? This is something people really rarely ask in these kind of discussions. It's a long conversation, but if you just have a few thoughts for this audience. You say this practice, you don't mean filmmaking, you mean in our sense like New Day or Clark Temkin as an organ, as no, democratic model. No, if you look back there in the eye and try to get across, we're doing this work, Both all right. as one giant bundle. How do you feel? Yeah. Seriously. Uh, no, seriously, I, I often think about it. I feel New Day and, and filmmaking for me, I mean, New Day specifically has really increased my belief in humanity and increased my belief that democracy works, can work if you take it seriously, and you really do make the adjustments that are needed for everybody. Um, democratic models can work. I'm not the least bit cynical about that because I've seen it over the last almost 50 years. Uh, in, in all the ways I've talked about, generational change and really reaching new audiences and, you know, doing the things that we set out to do in 1971. Uh, and it isn't old fashioned. You know, it's working. A lot of the filmmakers are in their 20s and 30s now. I love that. So I feel great about it. And I also feel very proud of the work that I've personally been involved in. You know, I, so I feel really good. I'm, I feel like I'm really lucky. Yeah, I, I would pretty much agree with all of that. I mean, I look back and I remember two things from my college years uh, very distinctly. I remember getting interested in film and I'm walking down an alley and I'm thinking to myself, boy, if I could just be a camera person on industrials, wouldn't that be great? That was my, you know, my crowning ambition. But at another time, I was with Temner and we were editing our first film, Home for Life. I, I just gotten out of college, and we're looking at this building uh, near the lake, kind of a mansion, and we're saying, wouldn't that be a great place for the Film Institute? Because we had some kind of dream of creating some kind of environment for this collegial kind of making of, and storytelling and all of that. And I, I, I have to make give a plug, uh, I didn't bring it down, I meant to and forgot. We just released uh, volume four of our early years DVDs called The Collective Years. I have a couple copies with me. It's also available on our uh, website. It's got some of those early films that we've been talking about and also uh, clips from this, this reunion. So we have time. We, we're basically out of time. We have one more question here. And then if you want to keep talking, Gordon and Julia, can you hang out a little bit? That'd be great. And thank you, everyone. This has been great, great questions and great conversation. Thank you for all the awesome things you're doing that you have done and that you'll continue to do. Very, very excited that you have come here to Ashland. And I don't know if you know it, but we have a New Day Network here. We meet once a month. And it's all the Rogue Valley Peace and Justice workers, and they've been doing a lot for the past 30 years. And um, also, we have a couple of independent media newspapers. And after the Independent Film Festival, it's our tradition to have the Independent Media Festival. So perhaps you can stay for that. Um, what we did here, at the grassroots level, the way we got the GMO crops banned is exactly what you're talking about. One-on-one -on -one conversations, weekly meetings, showing films, 
showing films, people's living rooms, showing films at the Grange, showing films at the library or churches. And so we were able to have a 67% of the people vote to ban the GMO crops. We also were very, very active about going out and getting signatures. And the interesting thing to me, because I've only lived here five years, is that the young people, especially the young people in the churches, have gotten so extremely involved in protecting Oregon from the um, LNG pipeline and the Coos Bay Terminal. And it's beautiful to see the young people. So my question is, as new generations come into your organizations and you pass the baton to the younger people, how in touch are they with grassroots movements? Is it just through social media or I mean, it's, it's sometimes very hard to find out what's going on in America through our newspapers, through the mainstream. You almost have to like read things from Reuters or for, from Europe to find out what's going on in America. So if you could tell us how the young people are taking the baton and what their issues are. Well, you're giving a great example of what we've been talking about, which is Without the grass, without grassroots activists, our films kind of mean nothing to me. I mean, in any big, real sense of social change. So that's a great example that you gave. Um, I don't know. My young friends, and I do have some who are in their 20s who are activists, are, are, do, use, do a lot on social media. But honestly, they also get together in person. I mean, so that's back to your point. That's like, wow, that's right. It isn't, we, we keep saying, us old ones, oh, those kids, all they ever do, they're on, the, they're on their phones all the time. But actually, when I think about it, they do, they actually do in my, in Cincinnati and Dayton that I'm aware of, they actually meet, they want to meet in person too. The follow-up maybe and some of the planning happens uh, on social media. I would say these days people are more connected nationally and regionally and locally than they ever were. I mean, in the, it, back in the day, we didn't know what was going on in even Cleveland, unless you went there yourself and talked to people. I do believe that all important change is local, as you're saying. I mean, I think that's what we, as filmmakers, always have to keep in mind. How do we get to the people on the ground? So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, uh, there was a period where I would run into uh, old activists who weren't activists anymore, who were like, oh, young people today, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, gee, I don't notice that. Because we're in a hub of young people. You know, we have interns in our diverse voices programs, and, and they're all about what you're talking about. Yeah, and, 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 you know, I mean, the Occupy movement, the Black Lives movement, and some of the things that came out of Occupy, like microphone. I mean, we never thought of that. No technology involved, but a brilliant use of a way to spread word through a crowd. The way that Black Lives Matter uses social media and uses you know, instant communication to make a new kind of demonstration. We used to go on the march, it went from here to here and the, everybody knew where we were going. Now there are people out there, it's like, okay, we're gonna block tra traffic on the outer drive and we'll stay there for like 14 minutes and then we move on. I mean, it's there are all kinds of things that young people are doing and they always have been. And there is, as you say, the mainstream media the, ne the mainstream media never pays attention to how democracy actually happens and how it works. If they get enough attention, if there's, you know, uh, if there's something happens, but I'm going to digress for a moment, but I think it comes back to Ashland, so I think it's, it's worth it. Uh, years ago, I did a pilot, I did two pilots for a series I was trying to get off the ground about, the first version was called Grassroots Journal, the second iteration was Community Works TV, but the idea was to make a news and information show for that other sector of society. 
the unions, the not-for-profit groups, community organizations, the PTA, all of that. How, and it was not, it was how, it was not like, oh, something you should know or an inspirational story. It was nuts and bolts. How do people get things done? One of the things that, how do you deal with a leadership transition? And one of the stories that I did, uh, or that we did actually, uh, Jenny was directing this, and we came to Ashland to film with the Applegate Partnership. I don't know if any of you remember that. Yeah, so the Applegate Partnership brought together loggers and environmentalists who were kind of at each other's throats to say, you know, we live in this community. We're all neighbors. And there's a lot of outside forces here. There's a lot of lines in the sand being drawn. If you do that, you've gone over to the dark side. Can't we meet together and come to some kind of common compromise about what affects us? And so that was the, the story that I did as one of the pieces in this short piece. And that's, I think that's what we're all interested in, finding those ways for communities to be empowered to make their own decisions. And yes, there are contradictions, but to, for neighbors to come together and work them out. Thank you. And thank you, everyone. We have to stop. I'm sorry.